This is a nice segue to uh, talking about more delivery issues. The challenge is, how do we get our reagents into cells? And there are lots of ways to do this. Um, we have to think about whether we are delivering DNA, uh, in which case uh, a gene, whether it's a Cas9 gene or a guide RNA gene, is going to have, to have regulatory sequences on that DNA template that uh, we deliver to cells. We have to worry some cells are actually fairly sensitive to DNA being delivered to them. Uh, DNA that's introduced into cells can integrate more or less at random into the genome and cause uh, disruption of important sequences. And uh, if we deliver a DNA vector in, into cells, it's going to stick around for a while. Uh, if it actually integrates, it's there forever uh, for the life of the cells. Um, and even if it doesn't integrate, it will persist for some period of time. People use viral vectors, and I'll talk about a couple of them. Uh, again, you have to uh, combine your expression sequences with regulatory sequences. Promoters, active promoters that have some enhancer characteristics have to have uh, poly A addition sequences at the end. Uh, and often it works best if you have a little, a little intron in protein coding, uh, in addition to protein coding sequences. Some viruses are very cell specific. They don't uh, infect all cells. And one of the most popular viral vectors for delivering uh, things to uh, cells and organisms has limited capacity. Um, you can deliver RNA directly to cells, but then you have something of a stability issue. You can make chemical modifications. Um, you can do protein delivery. How do you get proteins to get into cells? Uh, it's not a, not a trivial issue, particularly if you're talking about doing in vivo delivery in a whole organism. And again, there's a persistence or a stability issue. Different cells have different uh, capabilities of being transformed by different methods. Um, and particularly if you go to uh, different organisms, um, so uh, you have to worry about the sensitivity of cells to DNA delivery or, or other issues. Uh, and then uh, Dirk made a, a point that the uh, stem cells tend to be uh, have greater capability, quite a bit greater, greater capability of doing end joining than they do homologous repair. This is a, a something that, I, as I emphasized on Monday, varies a lot from cell type to cell type. Uh, are you going to be doing your, your uh, delivery uh, outside of a whole living organism or in a whole living organism? How much capability do you have of uh, manipulating that and ultimately generating whole organisms? It's another uh, advantage to stem cells, as Dirk was saying, that you can do uh, what's essentially an ex vivo uh, delivery, then generate a whole organism. Uh, are you doing this in somatic cells versus germline cells? And what are the organism-specific issues you have to deal with? So uh, you, you could add to this list with a lot of other things that could confound you as you're trying to do delivery in, in different systems. If we're talking specifically about uh, cultured cells, which a lot of you will be working with, and we, we work with, that's what we're doing in the laboratory, you can use a viral vector. You just uh, put your components, your essential components of the nuclease into a viral vector. You, uh, you can even put the, a donor DNA into a viral vector. Uh, you can use a plasmid DNA delivery. You can do, use direct RNA delivery, or as we're doing in the workshop, this ribonuclear protein delivery. And if, you've, if you're doing delivery of molecules rather than viruses, you have a lot of uh, different ways you can go. You can do lipofection, uh, these, these liposomes that uh, fuse with uh, cells. We're doing electroporation. There are different varieties of electroporation. I told some of you that I look at nucleofection, which is the Lanza electroporation, as being electroporation with fairy dust. So the, the nucleofection reagent uh, is is it's the magical fairy dust that they, they sprinkle onto uh, the cells to make it uh, work better. There are a variety of different nanoparticle delivery methods. And even in, in cultured cells, you can do manual injection. 
Mario Capecchi's first experiments that, that demonstrated uh, recombination in uh, cultured mouse cells were done by manual injection. Mario sat there at a microscope with a very, very tiny needle, needle and injected plasmid DNAs in, into uh, cultured cells. Just to start going over these um, more or less one at a time, if you're doing RNA delivery, what, how are you going to make the RNA? Well, just like we in vitro transcribe the guide RNA in the experiments you're doing here, you can in vitro transcribe uh, a messenger RNA. Now, a messenger RNA, it's a little more complicated. The guide RNA, we, don't, we actually don't want anything except R, you know, the encoded RNA nucleotides. We don't want 5' prime or 3' prime modifications. But messenger RNAs, to be effective, have to have a 5' prime cap and a 3' prime poly A tail. And you can buy kits that'll allow you to put a cap on after you've done a transcription with a bacterial RNA polymerase, uh, capping enzyme, and also poly A addition. But those are important considerations. You can also buy synthetic RNAs. Uh, IDT, if you went to the uh, table that's just outside, uh, they will sell you synthetic RNAs. Now, the IDT platform uses a constant tracer RNA and a CRISPR RNA. So they've gone back to the, to the natural system that has uh, two separate RNAs rather than the uh, combined single guide RNA. And the reason they do that is they can make barrels of the tracer RNA uh, and sell out of that barrel to anybody who asks. And then the CRISPR RNA itself is quite short. It's only 30 or 35 nucleotides, as I remember. And that has the unique guide sequence that you're going to use for your target. And because they make them synthetically, they can put in chemical modifications that improve the stability of the RNA. That's one that people do a lot of. Uh, people, the, these uh, companies that do uh, RNA and DNA synthesis are all also looking at chemical modifications that improve the efficacy, not just the stability. And uh, there are papers and presentations that will uh, tell you about that. And there are lots of ways to get RNA into cultured cells. If you're going to go with, a, with DNA delivery, uh, there are a variety of plasmids out there. And this is one out of the Zhang lab that a lot of people have used. I've used it uh, myself. And what it has, it's, it's, a, it's one of these standard plasmids that you can propagate in bacteria, but then introduce into cultured mammalian cells. And it has a uh, Cas9 gene. Ca the Cas9 gene has a couple of nuclear localization signals uh, around it. It's got a promoter that's driving it. But then up here, uh, there's a promoter, one of these RNA polymerase 3 promoters, to drive the expression of uh, the guide RNA. It's got uh, the, the three prime backbone of the guide RNA constitutively in the vector. And then it's got a, a little sequence here that can be cut out uh, with a restriction enzyme and replaced with the 20 or approximately 20 nucleotide guide sequence that you've just provided with a pair of uh, synthetic oligonucleotides that you can order quite cheaply from uh, any supplier. So you can put your specific guide sequence in here and then introduce this into cells. The Zhang lab and, and others have uh, generated um, viral genomes, uh, lentiviral genomes. This is a popular one, um, again, where you have a, a Cas9 gene with, with all the appropriate uh, uh, bells and whistles on it, driven by a constitutive promoter. And in this particular one, uh, the stuffer that you're going to replace with your guide sequence is much bigger, but you can cut it out uh, with, a, with a restriction enzyme and then uh, introduce introduce the, um, uh, the guide-specific sequence and the, the three-prime uh, framework sequence is already there on the vector. And then this, this can be used either to generate virus. You can use uh, producer cells to generate virus from this genome, or you can, you can introduce it uh, into cells as uh, DNA. A very popular vector, uh, or class of vectors, uh, uh, emerged from the gene targeting field uh, was the class of adeno-associated virus vectors. So adeno-associated virus um, 
the, the genome encodes mainly two proteins, although there are some small protein variants, uh, a replication protein and a capsid protein. And uh, the, the viral genome is mostly single-stranded, but it has these funny uh, 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 inverted terminal repeats that, that fold back on themselves. And there are a couple of reasons why th this vector has been popular, probably a number of reasons. But one is that uh, you can, if you use a helper virus that, or uh, cells that provide these essential proteins, you can throw away all of the internal sequence of the virus and re replace it with something uh, you'd, you'd like to, to deliver to cells. Uh, one thing you can do is just put in a transgene that has a promoter and a poly A addition sequence and get uh, delivery to cells of this transgene. Um, some, Depends on the, on the cells you're using. Human cells have a tendency to integrate this vector at the site that Dirk was talking about, this AAVS1 site. Um, uh, but it, the viral genome will persist in cells even if it's not integrated for quite some time. You can also use the vector to make a donor sequence. So uh, this is a gene targeting vector. It's, it's just got a donor that you're going to introduce. Um, and one of the reasons it, that this is a popular donor is apparently that because of these uh, uh, terminal repeat sequences that, that are structured, a donor that goes in in an adeno-associative uh, adeno virus vector doesn't tend to get concatenated, which may uh, sort of take it out of the picture uh, as a functional donor, but also it persists for a while. And the fact that it's single-stranded, at least in part of its lifetime, may also contribute to its efficacy as a donor. So it, it can serve as a pretty good donor. Now, the other thing that, for uh, CRISPR workshop purposes that people have done, is to put the CRISPR components into into uh, AAV vectors. You can put in Cas9 and a guide RNA with their promoters. And I talked uh, the other day about the fact that um, if your Cas9 is very big, the, the, the packaging capacity of this vector is about 4.5 KB. And some of that capacity is taken up by these uh, terminal repeat sequences. And you can't throw those away. So you only have about 4.2 KB of, of capacity that you can stuff into an AAV capsid and still have, a, have a, an infectious virus. Um, so if the Cas9 is too big, uh, people have said that uh, Pyogenes Cas9 is too big. There's not room for much else in the vector. You have, you have to have a promoter that'll drive it, a poly A addition sequence. Um, and it's often hard uh, to squeeze in even a guide RNA coding sequence. But the uh, Staph aureus Cas9 is smaller. This uh, Campylobacter uh, Cas9 that I mentioned is smaller. Um, the CPF1s are not much smaller. They're on the order of 1,300 amino acids, very similar to the Pyogenes Cas9. But you can use pairs of viruses. You can use one virus to express Cas9 and another virus to express the guide RNA. And you can put lots of guide RNAs in, well, several. Uh, the promoters tend to be a little bit a little bit large. Um, so you can multiplex with a two virus system. Um, there have been other solutions to this capacity problem. Uh, one of my friends has, has uh, worked to minimize the promoters that you use for uh, both the Cas9 expression and the guide RNA expression. And then it's not so hard to get the pyogenes Cas9 and a guide RNA into the, into the same AAV vector. But there are a variety of things you can do. And I'm going to, I'm going to come back to AAV, AAV in a little bit. We're doing RNP delivery. Uh, it works in a lot of different cell types. Uh, it tends to be quite efficient. I'm going to show you data from other people. Um, and one of the nice things is that uh, the way we're doing it, there's no cloning involved. You never have to make a molecular clone as long as somebody will give you the Cas9 
or <laughs> sell you the Cas9, and there are a lot of sources for that. And the other thing is that uh, you can use a lot of different donor templates. We're using a single-stranded oligo, but this is just uh, a paper where they, they actually use an AAV donor in conjunction with uh, RNP delivery. So you can, you can mix and match because you're in charge of all the molecules uh, that are going in. And then doing this electroporation is a good way to do delivery. The, the background on this is that the, the first RNP delivery of uh, Cas9 and a guide RNA was actually done in C. elegans. And I take credit for this because uh, <laughs> out, of, out of frustration. So we were working in C. elegans, and we could get somatic mutagenesis in the worms by the standard gonad injections, uh, injecting DNA, encoding uh, whatever nuclease. But we couldn't get germline uh, mutagenesis. And as, as I hope you know, uh, RNA interference was discovered in the C. elegans germline. So we were depending on putting in a vector that's expressing uh, the nuclease, but when, when that vector went in, it was probably also generating some antisense RNA, and so our, our, our vector was interfering with itself. So uh, just after the CRISPR system had been described, I spoke with Jin Soo Kim and said, uh, you know, if we could do, if we could do RNP delivery in C. elegans, we'd, we'd escape this whole interference because we're, we're never uh, generating a messenger RNA. We're never uh, dependent on anything that has an RNA intermediate. We're just putting in the nuclease uh, directly. And so this was the first system in which RNP was done delivering by injection directly into, into worms and uh, having some success. And then there were uh, several papers that emerged uh, not long after showing that this works well in cultured mammalian cells. And I'd like to show the data from uh, this paper, again, from Jin Soo Kim's lab. Uh, and it, it illustrates some of the properties of RNP that are, that are beneficial compared to plasmid DNA delivery. And uh, one is that the Cas9 is there right away. This is just... Uh, data from Western blots. So here are Western blots of this HA tagged Cas9. And with the RNP delivery, you've got RNP there right away. And then it disappears over the period of about a day. And it's gone. So you're ge you generate these indel mutations that's uh, illustrated here. These are T71 assays, just like the ones you're going to do. Um, the indels are detectable within just an hour or two of the, the delivery. And the, the mutagenesis plateaus uh, in less than a day, about a day. Plasmid delivery, uh, you don't see any Cas9 protein uh, until about 12 hours. Then it peaks, but then it's there for a long time because the plasmid's there for a long time. Um, and it's replenishing the, uh, the, the Cas9 protein. And the, the mutagenesis is occurring over, it doesn't even plateau for a couple of days. The disadvantage to having Cas9 there for a long time, and the guide RNA is on the same plasmid, uh, I think, this might have been a two, two molecule system, but the disadvantage is that after on-target mutagenesis is finished, off-target mutagenesis could, can continue with this uh, persistent Cas9 protein. So things happen early, and they're finished uh, in, a short, in a short period of time with the RNP delivery. Possibly for that reason, the specificity is a bit better. This is, again, this is from the same paper. So what you're looking at here is, uh, at the top, it, you're looking at uh, uh, three different targets. The on-target efficacy of plasmid delivery in green, RNP in blue, and then uh, mutagenesis at the secondary target, picking one or a couple of sites for each of the uh, guide RNAs. And uh, they're, they're uh, calculating a specificity ratio. This is a log scale, so there's a specificity ratio for the RNP 
and for the plasmid delivery. And in all cases, the specificity on versus off-target mutagenesis is a lot better for RNP versus plasmid delivery. This is a, there's a newer paper from this group that uh, amplifies on this, but this was the one that appeared a couple of years ago from a group at, at Thermo. Uh, they, pr they make their own, they have their own uh, electroporation system, it's called NEON, uh, and in their hands, uh, using the NEON electroporator and comparing it to uh, lipofection, uh, they found for lots of different uh, cell types that this is RNP delivery, was particularly with delivery by electroporation, was uh, better than uh, delivering plasmid, delivering uh, messenger RNA along with the guide RNA, and uh, better than lipofection in, in essentially all the cases. And so this is, this is looking at uh, cells that are, that are somewhat difficult to uh, to transfect some that are very easy to transfect. Uh, actually, you can do you can do a lot better than this. So we actually did a lot better than this in these human uh, CD34 positive cells. But the point is that uh, for a lot of different cell types, the RNP delivery uh, is better, and it it avoids some of the issues that you run into with DNA uh, or messenger RNA delivery. Okay, and this is just an example from a project that I did uh, when I was here uh, working with Mark DeWitt, um, and the, art, the article from Methods that we gave you a link to uh, along with the lab, uh, I believe this is a figure directly from that. We're just converting blue fluorescent protein to green fluorescent protein by changing a single codon uh, using RNP delivery and a donor that, that makes that, that codon change. And the uh, untreated cells, uh, this is a single-strand oligonucleotide donor, the untreated cells, uh, essentially all of them are BFP positive and a few laggers that are BFP negative. But after treatment, one treatment uh, with a guide RNA that cuts uh, using this PAM, so the cut is right there compared to the codon change, uh, after, after treatment, there are very, very few BFP only cells. A lot of them just had uh, the BFP gene knocked out, so they're now both BFP and GFP negative, and almost 25% are now GFP positive, uh, BFP negative. So very effective, and this was, this was done in uh, the HEK293 T cells in culture. So people have devised uh, other delivery methods, um, and they're bunch of papers that have come out in the last couple of years uh, promoting one or another uh, alternative delivery method. This is something that started out in, in David Liu's lab. And what they said is, well, um, you, can, you can do lipid delivery to cells using cationic lipids. They're, they're positively charged, and I guess they interact very readily with the negatively charged surface of cells, and they can deliver stuff to cells, and people use those for DNA delivery, RNA delivery. But many of the proteins that you'd like to deliver, the Cree recombinase, talons, uh, Cas9, they're positively charged, and they don't associate readily with these positively charged lipids. So what they did was they, they put a uh, an artificially negatively charged GFP onto each of these different proteins, or they, one way or another, generated negatively charged versions of, of these proteins, and then uh, associated them with lipids and delivered them to cells. And uh, this is an example where they're delivering Cree, and when Cree is active in cells, it turns on, uh, uh, turns on something that leads to the cells being Red, I don't know what, uh, Texas red was a dye anyway. And this works if um, the protein uh, has a large negative charge, but not if you fuse the, the Cree protein with, with something that has a modest negative charge or a positive charge. So uh, artificially making a protein negatively charged, then doing this uh, lipid delivery seems to work well. And then this is actually doing this with uh, Cas9 RNP and showing, and you, you can look at this paper, just showing efficacy uh, in, in um, 
this is in this case it's knocking out uh, an integrated GFP gene, uh, like some of the things I, I showed you before. So they were showing uh, that you could do Cas9 RNP delivery that way. In a in a, a subsequent paper, they looked at a variety of different lipids uh, for their uh, ability to do this Cas9 RNP delivery, um, and these are lipids that uh, when when they fused with cells and got into cells, that the lipid would be degraded because of the um, uh, be, because of the uh, reducing environment inside the cell, and these these disulfide bonds would be broken, and it would lead to more efficient release of the cargo. And they did some things where they injected uh, one of these negatively charged Cree lipid nanoparticle complexes into mouse brain in a situation where uh, the presence of Cree would turn on a red fluorescent protein gene and just showed that, uh, that uh, using this by lipid delivery was much better than just trying to put the protein in uh, by some other method. So uh, that's a, these, these lipid particle delivery systems are ones that are being developed for in vivo delivery, particularly in a situation where you don't have the cells sitting out there nicely for you in culture waiting for you to slam something into them. Another version is just using uh, gold beads that are coated with uh, 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 polyarginine or some polymer it has arginine on the end. Uh, and then in this case, what they did was they, they put a, they call it an E tag. So E, as you remember, is glutamic acid, right, in, in our shorthand. And so they have this polyglutamic acid at the end terminus, a nuclear localization signal here. This assembles readily into these gold arginine nanoparticles, and then it's a way to deliver to cells. And one of the things I liked about uh, the data in this paper is they actually have frames from a little movie showing, uh, so there's, there's GFP in this system someplace. Anyway, uh, they, they, they're monitoring the, the particles going into cells. They're originally these uh, fluorescent dots, but over a period of time, you begin to see the fluorescence. A little hard to see. You, you can see the final product. The fluorescence builds up in the cytoplasm and then in the nucleus of the cell to which delivery is being done. Uh, so you, you, you can actually watch uh, in real time what What's, what's going on, and they're getting, they're using a T71 assay at a couple of different targets, they're getting uh, pretty efficient uh, indel formation. This is a procedure that uh, has been developed here. Uh, Brett Stahl uh, is a postdoc or a super postdoc uh, working with Jennifer Doudna, and what, what they did was to uh, just start putting more nuclear localization signals onto Cas9. So a sort of a standard Cas9 has two nuclear localization signals uh, at, on the C-terminus. I think it's the C-terminus of the protein. So what they began doing is put lots of nuclear localization signals onto the other end of the protein. So this protein now has six NLSs on it. Not only is this going to help the protein get into uh, the nucleus, once it gets into the cell, but it helps the protein get into the cell because there are certain short positively charged peptides that uh, in general are called cell penetrating peptides that help proteins get into cells from the outside of cells by more or less mysterious mechanisms. And uh, I think that's the reason that putting these extra NLSs on uh, helps to uh, get get uh, the Cas9 protein associated with the guide RNA into cells. And you can see the NLS uh, is mostly positively charged amino acids. So I've been looking around at what's available for purchase in terms of Cas9s. And this is reminding me of like the razor blade thing in the 90s where we just kept putting more and more razor blades on and selling it. So he's got four, he's got six. How yeah. many NLSs is enough? According to them, uh, keeping the two at one end and putting four on the other end is now their standard. Okay. Kind of crazy over, over it. 
Well, except that, um, so they call the one, they, they call this one or the one that, uh, that has, also has a GFP appended to it, they call this the 4NLS version. And the 2NLS version, which is this one, is not as effective at low concentrations of RNP being delivered to cells. And these are neural progenitor slash stem cells in, in culture. Hmm? What, what's, are, they aren't electroporated? I don't think so. I think they're just putting it in the medium. So, so the answer to the, your question depends on whether it's being electroporated. So this is just putting it in the medium. And the reason for that is that when, you do in, when, you, when you're doing in vivo delivery, so that was in culture delivery, in vivo delivery, then uh, you can't electroporate. But I don't know, maybe with electroshock therapy, you could. Uh... So that's actually, you can, so there's, there's cool <laughs> stuff that you can do. So you, in 13.5 mass embryo, you can open between 9 and 5 and 13.5, you can take, a, take an embryo and that is still sitting in the uterus, and you can electroshock that. And you can inject DNA, and then electroshock where will go. So <laughs> that, that is doing. <laughs> When <laughs> and then you, of course, put the embryo, we, we, we put the virus back and then sort the mother, and you will get a green animal out of it as it goes into the womb. Yeah. Awesome. It's very, very. <laughs> you can't shock any cell, right. probably. <laughs> but in, a, in an adult brain, this is harder. <laughs> Anyway, so they, they do injections into different, uh, different uh, locations in the brain. And uh, this paper appeared just in the last month or two in Nature Biotechnology. You can go take a look at it uh, in more detail. Uh, one of the issues, of course, is that uh, this RNP is localized right around the injection site. It doesn't go very far from the injection site. So you, they're, they're showing local uh, modification. I can't remember. This is a, again, it's a, um, it's a turn on of a fluorescent protein gene that the RNP is, is mediating, um, but you don't go far from the injection site. Back to AAV, for in vivo delivery, this particular scheme uh, is in a clinical trial. The clinical trial is enrolling. Currently, and it's the clinical trial was initiated by Sang people at Sangamo Biosciences, and what they do is they it's not shown well here, but the first uh, AAV encodes zinc finger nucleases for a particular site in the first intron of the albumin gene. Okay, so when when uh, this is delivered, it'll make a break. The second AAV has a donor DNA that has homology, a few hundred base pairs of homology on either side of that cut site, and then a cDNA for a therapeutic gene. Okay? So uh, after the break is made at some frequency, you'll get homologous recombination, and you'll get this uh, cDNA incorporated, uh, just as Dirk was describing for uh, another situation. It's got a splice acceptor site. So uh, when the albumin locus is transcribed, you'll get uh, uh, splicing to this cDNA. And now you've got a therapeutic uh, protein being made from this spliced messenger RNA. Okay, And the, the trials that have been approved are for uh, hemophilia. That's using a factor 9, or I guess they're also doing factor 8 for hemophilia B, hemophilia A. And they're also d doing this for some lysosomal storage diseases. And the, I don't remember what's here, yeah. The, the target tissue is the liver. They did things in mouse, which I'll show you the data for. But the trial has been approved to do this in humans. So there are a couple of favorable things here. One is that AAV, like a lot of things that you inject into people, uh, homes to the liver. And liver cells are the ones that are most likely to take up the viruses. And there, and there are two of them. 
Second thing is that in all of these cases, you don't need a huge amount of the therapeutic protein made in order to, to provide therapeutic value. So with factor IX, it's a clotting factor. Uh, these lysosomal storage enzymes, you don't need to make a huge amount of them. And uh, they are normally made in the liver anyway. So you're, you're inserting them in cells in the liver. You're making some of them. The albumin promoter is a very strong promoter. So uh, e even the minority of cells that are getting this modification, they're producing enough of the therapeutic protein. Now, you, they're also mutating uh, albumin genes. Uh, you make enough albumin that uh, having some number of cells no longer making albumin isn't a problem for people. Fyodor Ernoff even told me that albumin is a non-essential protein. I'm not sure I believe that, but, uh, but making some NHEJ mutations more frequently than you're getting these, these insertions is not a particular problem for therapeutic purposes. And this is just showing uh, the scheme again. This is uh, the factor nine. This is doing it in mouse, uh, and then assaying the human factor nine, um, and they're getting measurable amounts of the human factor nine, and it's dose dependent. Okay, yeah. Yeah. Um, however, uh, AAV has been a popular vector for the the gene, you know, the raw gene delivery uh, field for a long time, and I don't. I'm not as familiar with. Uh, all of the immunological issues. There's also a, an immunological issue regarding now newly making factor IX in people who never made it before. Uh, so there are some some challenges. One of the it, I do know that it's it's uh, it's a problem if you try to do repeated injections of AAV. Um, there are a number of serotypes, and so it may be you can do an initial one with a serotype that uh, people haven't been exposed to before, but you can't come back with the same serotype without uh, initiating an uh, inappropriate immune reaction. OK, I'm going to uh, quit pretty soon. This is a, a procedure that came out of Niran Murthy's lab here at Berkeley uh, with some help from the IGI folks. And uh, what, the, what they uh, did was to link the donor DNA chemically to the guide RNA and then do RNP delivery. So if the, uh, if, if the donor DNA and the, the, the presence of the donor DNA at the target is a limiting factor, what if you bring the donor DNA along with the nuclease? Uh, so as soon as the cut is made, the donor's there. Will that help? And uh, so the, the first thing they did was they showed that um, you could make chemical modifications uh, either at the five prime or at the three prime end of the single guide RNA without badly disrupting the ability uh, to, to make indels. And this is just uh, uh, indel frequency uh, with uh, Cas9 and with one of the CPF1 proteins. Um, and this one has a DNA actually linked to the five prime end through one of these chemical linkers. Okay, so they showed that that didn't uh, really disrupt uh, the NHEJ frequency. They compared. Uh, so this is this is NHEJ frequency as a function of dose of this G donor. They call it G donor uh, guide donor. Uh, complex uh, electroporated in uh, as, a, as an RNP. Uh, and uh, indel frequency is a function of dose. This shows that it, um, if you provide the donor by electroporation for, uh, to cells in culture, that uh, providing the donor separately or as part of the guide RNA, you get about the same amount of homologous repair. That's in cultured cells. Uh, using electroporation. So it doesn't hurt, doesn't help much. But if you're doing, uh, if you're doing del delivery, uh, you're doing RNP delivery using uh, a lipid nanoparticle, which is what this 
is. Um, then the G donor helps a lot compared to uh, doing things with, uh, with um, the donor, donor being separate. And it's this uh, lipid style, this nanoparticle delivery, that people are going to uh, need to rely on rather than electroporation for in vivo delivery. So uh, if you ask Mirren, as I did, uh, weren't you discouraged by this? He says, no, because we're, we're thinking about in, in vivo delivery and the, the, the efficiency of homologous repair with um, uh, this lipid nanoparticle delivery in cultured cells is not as good as electroporation, but you can improve what it's doing uh, with, with this fusion. Maybe it's a little subtle, but I've traditionally thought of HDR as being DNA-mediated. This is RNA-mediated. Does it recruit a single strand? Or is this a single strand? This is, sorry, this is single-stranded DNA yeah. linked to the RNA. So the, the RNA, it's not very well illustrated here, the RNA is bound to Cas9. This is sgRNA. And then there's a chemical linker, and then there's a single-stranded DNA. And they're using the same single-stranded DNA, either linked or an unlinked. In the, okay? Is the effect sequence-specific? They haven't tried very many. Uh, what do we mean sequence-specific? sequence-specific. Yes. So um, if you... If you make the, the, the linked DNA on the G donor be a scrambled DNA, uh, then it's, it's not helping. OK. All right. Other organisms, there are organism-specific methods for getting things in. In C. elegans, uh, people still inject uh, directly into the syncytial gonad, uh, where there are lots of nuclei all in one cytoplasm. Uh, in plants, people use a gene gun with uh, typically gold, sometimes platinum uh, uh, particles, uh, and they just shoot it at the tissue. Uh, it, it's coated with DNA, shoot it at the tissue, the DNA goes in. And plant cells are particularly hard to, to um, transfect uh, be, because of the cell wall. And many plants, you can't even, you can't even make cells uh, that will ultimately regenerate a plant. You have to use uh, whole uh, tissue segments. And then in, in many plants, you can use an agrobacterium method for delivering DNA. Uh, use a natural plasmid, an agrobacterium, put in your gene of interest back into the bacteria. It'll uh, then infect plant cells and, or calluses from plants, and then you can, in some species, regenerate a whole plant. And, and um, Young Jay will talk a lot more about this uh, this evening. In a lot of organisms, you can do direct embryo injection. And so Drosophila, this has been going on for a long time. Mouse, zebrafish, pig. Uh, and so this is, this is cool. You can, you can inject RNP. You can inject RNA. You can inject DNA. Um, but it, this utility in, in essentially all mammalian organisms has also made people a little uncomfortable. And uh, both Jennifer and I referred to that on Monday. So if you can, if you can artificially inseminate uh, a monkey uh, egg, and then inject uh, CRISPR materials into this, into this fertilized egg and get uh, genome-modified monkeys out, germline genome-modified monkeys out, uh, there's an easy system to do this in humans. And there are several uh, reports. Uh, I've got the one here and then a, a couple of uh, more recent ones where, peop where people, labs in China, have actually uh, injected CRISPR materials into human embryos. The first two papers were done with non-viable human embryos. I believe the third paper was actually done with, a viable, with viable human embryos, but the experiment was terminated when the you know, embryos were still only a couple of weeks old. But this, this is the technology that has made people nervous about the possibility for human germline uh, gene modification. Anyway, 
That was a quick run through for, for a lot of techniques for uh, doing delivery. And whatever your system is, uh, you're dependent on what works in your system. Uh, it may not be the same as what works in somebody else's system. So you're dependent on uh, delivery methods. You're also dependent on the repair capabilities of the cells or organisms that you're working with. So it's been one of the interesting things as people have, have uh, spread the technology to different organisms, uh, they've had to, had to reinvent the methods uh, in, in each case uh, for, for effective delivery. So I think that's it. <laughs>